They are the remotest of nations, the most just of men, the favorite of the gods. The lofty inhabitants of Olympus journeyed to them to take part in their feasts. Their sacrifices are the most agreeable of all that mortals can offer them. This is how Homer described the Nubians around 3,000 years ago, an African people who lived along the banks of the River Nile. When I was growing up, I used to hear people in my neighborhood talking about black pharaohs. We called them Nubians. I never dreamed that there was an actual place called Nubia. It seemed more like a fairy tale to me. I'm in Cairo at the beginning of my journey in search of ancient Nubia. From here, I'm heading south along the Nile to Aswan, Egypt's southernmost city where Nubia begins. Then I'll cross over into the Sudan and travel to the heart of the ancient black kingdoms of the Nile. Egypt is the only ancient African civilization most people have heard of. Nobody knows anything at all about Nubia. I've wanted to see the pyramids since I was a child, and it's taken me 40 years to get here. I can see why people are obsessed with this place. This extraordinary royal tomb was built for an Egyptian pharaoh four and a half thousand years ago. Egypt has become a place of pilgrimage for African Americans trying to rediscover their identity. And for many of us, Nubia is just a black word for Egypt. So why have you come to Egypt? Uh, I think for me, it's, it's just been a dream come true and then trying to make a connection um, to hi historical past that we've been uh, misled about all this time. And so, what, do you, what do you mean, we? Oh, I mean, me, we, I say, uh, in terms of African-American people, when we look at um, the history of Egypt, we've always been told that Egypt is out of Africa and not a part of Africa. Um, and to actually be on the continent, for me, is just a really th a big thrill. We were growing up, though, in school, all the pharaohs yeah. looked like white guys. I mean, they could have been from Milwaukee or someplace, yeah, yeah. or Min Minnesota, yeah. like you are. <laughs> Like, what was that about? I think it was to continually enslave us. I come to get a sense of my history and not the history that I was given as uh, African-American in America by the Europeans. Mm -hmm. Well, who do you think built the pyramids? I think Africans built the pyramids. I grew up believing that uh, they were European or, or, or they looked like Europeans. They were white, you know, the Cecil B. DeMille story. <laughs> and I think they were uh, Nubians which is uh, dark skin. How about your color, darker? Uh, I think all shades. Mm -hmm. I think all shades. Uh, just like uh, African Americans, we come in a lot like, of, yeah. Just like this group. Yeah, exactly. Back home, the real Nubians have got lost in a debate about the color and origins of the ancient Egyptians. But 400 miles south of here, there is still a real place called Nubia the home of an ancient African civilization that was definitely black. How much a t-shirt? Five pounds? <laughs> Too much, I want the Nubian price. <laughs> I'm a Nubian. <laughs> I'm taking the night train from Cairo to Aswan. Once, all the land along the Nile, south of Aswan as far as Khartoum in the Sudan, belonged to Nubia. It still exists, but now it's just a region split in two by the border between Egypt and Sudan. I was hoping there was another room in there. <laughs> well, it's cozy. This is it.
African Americans are obsessed with Nubia. There must be a thousand shops in America with the name Nubia in the title. My favorite, my daughter's favorite, is a shop called Nubia Notions. But believe me, there are a whole lot more. When I was applying to Yale, the first sentence of my application said, my grandfather is colored, my father is a Negro, and I am black. Now my daughters are African Americans. Their kids, I bet, will be neo-Nubians. You know, if we can't tell exactly what the color of the Egyptian pharaohs were, the one thing we do know is that the Nubian pharaohs were black people. And now, having heard about Nubians almost all my life, I'm on a train heading south to the land of Nubia. I'm embarrassed to admit that I know so very little about the real Nubians. But the ancient Greeks and the Romans knew the Nubians. Magical tales about this distant African people traveled back along the trade routes to Europe. And one of the Nubian kings, named Taharqa, is even mentioned in the Bible. My search starts here, at the temple of Abu Simbel. It turns out that this great Egyptian monument is in fact in Nubia, built at a time when the ancient Egyptians ruled it. Most Egyptologists aren't that interested in Nubia, but I found one who's passionate about it. Bassam el Shema thinks that Nubian history has been ignored for far too long. Ramesses II, about 1250 BC, a man who ruled our country for about 66 years and two months, because that's documented, actually decided him and his very dedicated workers to come here and carve Hewen of the Cliffs, a temple dedicated to the Nubian deities. Huh. Normally, in temples of Ramesses and other pharaohs, you would find a very typical classic scene of the pharaoh smiting his captives of war using a mace head and that's showing his domain and his vigorosity. But in this temple, as I'm gonna show you now, okay. we found the facial features of the statues, which was hewn of the cliffs, especially the family that he is introducing to the Nubian brothers and sisters. He's showing his mother, he's showing his daughters. And one of the best examples of this is our lady here. First of all, we notice how the facial features are typically Nubian. And then you've got the hairstyle the Nubian style, the Afro style, and that, of course, the style that all the queens of Egypt wanted to be in the afterlife. And we know that the Nubians were always referred to in ancient Egypt as a sign of beauty. One of the ancient lyrics go, I wish my lover was a Nubian. Mm -hmm. So that is exactly the attraction of the face itself. I have to admit that I like the idea that the daughters of the pharaoh wanted to look like Nubian princesses, even if it was to persuade the people here to worship them. I don't want to interrupt your narrative, but I have to ask you this. How sure. come you know so much about Nubia, man? You must be the, the, the blackest Egyptian <laughs> I've ever seen. Uh, it doesn't, uh, Nubia doesn't have to make any effort for anybody to fall in love with her. She is, uh, she's a beautiful culture. She's a beautiful, informative culture. She gave us a lot. And when I came down from Alexandria to Aswan, to the beginning of the heart of Nubia, I decided I want to learn the language. I want to learn the songs and learn the dances, and most importantly, I want to know about those people, about their lives, about their history, about their culture, so you because they're part of me. So you can marry one of the women, Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I got lucky. <laughs> this temple itself got lucky. In 1964, when the Egyptians started to build the Aswan Dam, it was moved here block by block to save it from being drowned. The Aswan Dam is modern Egypt's greatest engineering project, bringing electricity and water to the entire country. But it devastated Nubia, flooding 500 square miles of its land. When I look out over this lake, all I can think about is what we can't see, all the history of an ancient civilization that's been lost.
Many of the people displaced by the dam now live in and around the city of Aswan. They still call themselves Nubians and are fiercely proud of their culture and history. There's even a program on local television called Nubian Treasures, hosted by Ezra Dahab. You know, I'm an African-American, and African-Americans are in all colors, sizes, and shapes. When I look at the Nubian people on this boat, it's the same. They're all colors. Yes. Some are dark, some are light. Mm -hmm. But not, not, not all of them is Nubian, but I think it's most of them are Nubians. But um, uh, Nubians are having, uh, have some um, special features of the face, of the, uh, of the color. But uh, if I can see you... Uh, I can say if you are Nubian or not. Mm. Uh, not only from the color, I think it's from the, the, the soul. The soul? Yes, from the soul. How about me? <laughs> I think you are Nubian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only Nubian, yes? You look I... like Nubian men here in, uh, in Aswan. I do, really? Yes, I think so. And the, most of them, most of them saying Salaamu Alaikum, good morning to you. They think that you are from Aswan and you are Nubian. I like that. <laughs> I like you know, African Americans are obsessed with Nubia. They love Nubia. They want to. They don't even know where Nubia is. <laughs> but they, well, the one thing they know is that black pharaohs and it ran Egypt. And they think that it's the greatest of all the black peoples, the Nubian people. Yes, because Nubia is a part of Africa and the, the American African people, they are a part of Africa. I think their hearts, although they are living in America, I think their hearts, a, a, a piece of their hearts is still in Africa. Ezra has brought me to the only Nubian village that survived the flood. It's called Garb Eswan. Hey, the fruit is nice, huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this village, I can say that it looks like uh, the traditional Nubian village. Uh, all the Nubians are like the Nubians in the ancient villages. Uh, they still, till now, talking with the Nubian language. Mm -hmm. They still, till now, wearing the Nubian clothes. They mm -hmm. stay till now, uh, having their traditions, tradition in, um, in all the occasions of their life, traditions on uh, uh, wedding and celebrating. Uh, they say the same. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Since the loss of their land, Younger Nubians like Ezra are determined to preserve their own language and culture and want to find out more about their ancient history. This area which the Nubia, the real Nubia, was there. Uh, and now it's under the water. Yes, because the water covered every place there. Just the monuments, we could save it, and the people. When I was a boy, a little boy, mm -hmm and the dam was being built, it was famous. People talked about it all over the world. Mm -hmm. But the black Americans in my hometown were very angry because they said it was racist. And I remember a woman, a school teacher, started a campaign to try to save Nubian culture because she, she said that the only reason they were building it here was to bury Nubian culture because Nubians were the black people. That, does it make you angry that Nubian civilization is buried under that lake? Not angry, but uh, it makes me sorry okay, because sorry. I, um, I dreamed that one day I, I could visit this place. I dreamed that uh, uh, if I could have the chance to, to live uh, even one day hmm. in, the, in the ancient Nubia. Hmm. Because my father all told me many things about it. My grandfather and mother and all the history books or, or all the books which talking about the, the Nubia. And when I, I, I see the, the pictures of the, uh, the Nubia and the palm trees which the, 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 the water is covering till the end, hmm. sometimes I, I cry. Yeah. Ezra wanted me to see where most Nubians live today. Balana was one of the villages specially built by the government 35 years ago for refugees from the flood. How far from the river are we? From the river? Yes, it's about two, two kilometers. Out. Uh, it's not uh, on the river. Uh, no. No, it's not Wait, on so the river directly. No. So it's a long way? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. They lost their close relationship with mm. the Nile because in the ancient Nubia, there, uh, most of the houses were on the Nile. Just a few steps to let your feet touch the <laughs> Nile waters. 68 tourists were killed by Islamic terrorists just a few weeks before I arrived, so security is tight. To be honest, I'm not sure who I'm more afraid of. These guys were the terrorists. Ezra was determined that I would meet Fazea Suleiman, whose family lost their home to the flood when she was only nine years old. Once the dam was completed, what effect did it have on your family and the other Nubian people? Did it cause your family pain, distress? Did it make her sad to have to move her family? When it happened, I felt that my family was affected. We were in the middle of something. We were in the middle of something. We were in the middle of something. She's saying that uh, the benefits of the high dam more than uh, every anything they, they lost there. We were in the middle of something. There is no pain for her family. For moving from the uh, uh, ancient Nubia to hmm. the modern uh, Nubian villages, uh, she is very happy because uh, now she has the chance to uh, to educate, to, to learn, and uh, mm -hmm. her children uh, are in the school learning. That's good. And she hopes yeah. uh, that she will learn uh, like them one day. But, but do you miss? Now I'm confused. She wasn't supposed to say that. She was supposed to be against the dam. But there's a policeman in the background. Uh, this nice lady clearly has been programmed by the security police that are outside protecting us from terrorists or the threat of terrorism to say that building the dam was the greatest thing in, in her life, when in fact it was devastating to her and to her family and to her neighbors, all of whom were forcibly removed and dumped in this makeshift village. Once the policeman leaves, Fazea calms down. The older people, hmm. were they, did it upset them? Hmm. Did it make them angry? Did it hurt them when they were forced to move? <laughs> she says that uh, most of the old, uh, old people during uh, moving, they were crying hmm. and saying uh, goodbye our land. Or uh, afialogo in uh, the Nubian uh, language. Afialogo. 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 Yes, that means uh. afialogo. Beladeni. Goodbye, our land. She says she missed everything. It's become clear to me that I'm not going to find ancient Nubia here in Egypt. South of here, in the Sudan, I've heard that ancient Nubian cities have survived out in the desert. It's just my luck that the border's closed. So I've got to go all the way back to Cairo, then fly south to Khartoum before driving north again on a 2,000-mile round trip to the heart of ancient Nubia. My family and my friends think that I'm out of my mind to be going to the Sudan. All we ever hear about the Sudan is that it's in a state of civil war, it has a fundamentalist Islamic government, and it hates Americans. So I'm kind of nervous. It took two hours to fly here from Cairo. It took four hours to get out of the airport because of the very strict security, and more forms than you've ever seen. I'm holding all my permission forms, permission to enter the country, permission to travel to the north, permission to make our film, even permission to take photographs for my family. But what can you say? Despite that, I am very excited because I am finally making my way to the heart of the Nubian kingdom, the ancient black kingdom of the Nile. The desert is so peaceful. I can hardly believe that I'm in a country torn apart by famine and civil war. But all that's 600 miles away, thank God. I'm heading north to Meroe, the last of the great cities of ancient Nubia.
These pyramids are spectacular. I had absolutely no idea that anyone had built pyramids in the middle of the Sudanese desert. Ali Osman Saleh, a Nubian archaeologist and an old classmate of mine from Cambridge, has come to show me around. Yeah, why? Um, at the 3rd century BC, the Marawais had their own language, written language. A written language? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The written language. The Marawais controlled a vast region. The Marawais had produced beautiful art. Mm. This is one of the greatest peoples of the world. They negotiated the most difficult environment that we must have seen if you are coming from there. They negotiated it, they conquered it, they made a civilization. I can't believe that 40 generations of Nubian kings and queens are buried here. For almost a thousand years, from the time of the ancient Greeks to the fall of Rome, Meroe flourished. But we still know so little about it. Meroitic civilization is clouded in mystery. Nobody really knows what these buildings are for, but Ali has his own theory. This was a learning place. A learning place? Yeah. Like a college, a university? Like a college university. Oh. Cairo called it the College of Marae. The College of Meroe. The College of Marae. Now we are considering that idea seriously. If, it, if this is true, then it's the oldest university it in Africa. It is the university, it is. Hmm. It looks so. It, it looks it looks like a college. This is an educational sanctuary, as far as I'm concerned. It, 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 it is a lot of rooms, a lot of places. And of course, last year, when the excavation was going on here, they have discovered a very beautiful garden there hmm. with fine uh, ditches uh, for irrigation. That was the Department of Nubian Studies over there, right? Yeah, that was the part of Nubian <laughs> Studies, yeah, possible. Mm -hmm. We are now studying the Isles of the <laughs> first African The college. University of Maryland. The University of Maryland. A 2,000-year-old college, marooned in the middle of a desert. If that's what it is, it ought to be one of the great monuments of the world. Instead, the whole of Meroe feels like some strange mirage. I'm driving north to find an even older Nubian city. The journey is supposed to take two days, but there are no roads, no hotels, acres of sand, no toilet, and no showers for 200 miles. I've been thinking about what these sand dunes remind me of, and I think it's caramel ice cream or caramel ice cream, like big mounds of off brown ice cream. You go over a sand dune and you think you're all alone. And then two people pop out of nowhere with goats or riding a camel. Or you go off to use the bathroom over a hill uh, in the middle of the night, as I did last night. And uh, I almost stepped on a camel, which is quite frightening. <laughs> if I didn't have to go to the bathroom before I saw the camel, I had to go after I saw the camel. But it's also not difficult to understand why the people who live near the Nile and in these sand dunes were a mystical people. It is stunningly beautiful under the stars. Last night I stepped out of my tent at 3 a.m. to go to the bathroom. And it was as if the, the sand were snow. From the moonlight, the sand had been transformed into this beautiful white cover that reminded me of Christmas time in, in Boston.
Come here. Yeah. You want me to push? Yeah. You must be joking. <laughs> I love the taste of the sand for breakfast. Hey, we At night, the temperature in the desert drops to zero, but not in my tent. I hated to camp when I was a kid, so I can't believe I'm enjoying this. What a relief to get out of that desert. Now I understand why people worship the Nile. I'd forgotten that this many people even lived in the Sudan. I'm here for a Nubian wedding. Maybe I'll get a chance to dance with some Nubian princesses. The groom has asked me to be his guest of honor. The Nubian on the left is me. That was just the first part of the ceremony. Now we're at Nubia's version of the bachelor party. Congratulations, my brother. Okay. How do you feel today? I am feeling very well. Very, I'm very so happy. Happy? Yes. Are you scared? Or nervous? No. No? No. When I got married, I was scared. <laughs> <laughs> The Nubians were Christians for 1,200 years before they became Muslims in the 16th century. Some even took part in the Crusades. We've come to the river for a ritual that dates back 3,000 years. The groom cuts through the water with his sword to receive the blessings of the Nile. I hate to leave but I have to get going. After all, ancient Nubia awaits. The next morning, at the sacred mountain of Jebel Barco, I meet up with Irene Liverani, an Italian archeologist. This is the temple of Mut. So it was built uh, uh, by Taharka, who, who is the, the, the great uh, black pharaoh who has to fight against the, the Assyrians in, uh, just to defend Egypt and Nubia. So uh, 
as you can see, it is uh, well preserved and we have yeah. beautiful reliefs here. When the god uh, woke up in the morning, uh, the priest or the king used to, to, to offer him uh, cakes and milk and good food. Mm. And of course, uh, uh, priests were just playing music for him, just to, to let him wake up in joy. Mm. That's <laughs> wonderful. It's a nice, uh, um, it's, it's very, uh, joyful uh, religion, mm. the religion of, uh, of ancient, ancient Nubia. In the 8th century BC, the kings of Nubia conquered the whole of Egypt, and this was their capital. Wow, Irene, who built this, this temple? Pianchi built uh, the temple, Pianchi? or better, he uh, enlarged, refurbished the temple after the defeat of Egypt. Now, who was Pianchi? Uh, Pianchi <clears throat> was uh, the first uh, black pharaoh. He presented himself as a black man as a pharaoh, but black, huh. with uh, all the features of a black man, and this had a been... powerful black man, mm. beautiful, beautiful, of course. This hadn't <laughs> been done before in Egyptian art? Uh, black people <clears throat> were represented under the feet of the pharaohs. That's so interesting. Huh. And he, uh, uh, he presented himself as a black, uh, so powerful, to be kings, even in Egypt. Black African kings ruled the whole of ancient Egypt for almost a century. But how many of us have ever heard of them? Why have scholars been so reluctant to give Nubia the credit that you are willing to give it? Racism. Racism? Racism. I call it racism. Mm. And when they found this culture so interesting, so, so beautiful, so important, they first uh, thought, oh, it is the Egyptian culture here in Nubia. If this were Egypt, I'd be queuing with hundreds of other visitors and a guide. But I've not seen one single tourist since I arrived here. I'm in one of the greatest tombs of antiquity, all by myself. For almost a hundred years, black men and black women were the most powerful rulers in the entire world. Here at last, I finally found the treasure that I've been searching for, the black pharaohs of the Nile. This is so The Sudanese are just about the friendliest people I've ever met. Ah, assalamu alaikum. Yep, hala. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, assalamu alaikum. I feel stupid that I've been so worried about being hated as an American. Yeah, I don't know if I got a bad. 
Here I meet Ahmed Asman from Khartoum. It turns out that he was a student in the United States. Would you like a uh, grape or uh, oranges? Come with this stuff. Uh, this stuff, come. I like oranges. You like oranges? Uh, become a uh, desta. About six. Uh, do you know desta? No, no, desta, yeah. Or does it? Or does it? Yeah, for everybody. I need a is desta. How much will that be? That will be 4,000 pounds, which is about $2. Yeah, we'll buy it. Banana, can you banana? Banana? No, we're fine. Mm. Thank you very much. Okay, let me help okay. you. Ahmed has persuaded me to give him a lift to an oasis on the way. Would you believe that it's famous for burying people in the sand? When we arrive, the school principal is keen to tell me all about it. Why are the sands here so good for your health? These sands which are present here are quite different from sands elsewhere. ولذلك فيها نوع من المواد تقريبا تكاد تكون جيرية ربما إنه ذي يكون السبب لكن الدراسات ما محددة يعني ما حصل الدراسة مغنن عشان توري على إنه الميزة الأصلية في الرمال. Some chemical ingredients. which are useful for health, but no studies have been done to determine what are these ingredients. Hmm. Well, I don't have rheumatism, but I have arthritis. So do you think it can cure me in my hip? I said that I don't have rheumatism, but I have arthritis, which is the problem. Is it possible? Maybe. It may be. Well, I want to give it a chance. You have to try it. You have to try it. I want to try it. Tell him I've come all the way from America to try your sand. <laughs> and before I know it, I am trying it. Take off your watch. Take off my watch. Okay, take off my watch. Watch. Take your glass. Take off your glass. I can't see. Your glasses. Your glasses. My, glasses. Good. my shoes. Yes, it's true. Okay. My socks. Yes. Okay, my socks, my clean white socks. Mm -hmm. Go. Okay. Now what? Get in here? Yes. To go inside. With these? The what? Okay. Which, my head here? Which way? Oh, okay. 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 I can't believe that this man has persuaded me to take all my clothes off in the middle of the desert. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, do. I just want to know something. Yalla, yallad. Feels rather good, actually. Well, I have to say, I've been buried in the sand many times by my daughters when they were small, and it never occurred to me it would cure anything, except their boredom. I feel like a mummy. Yalla, yalla. He's telling you, you take care of yourself. Okay. I'm going out now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you are on your own. I'm on my own. Yeah. yeah. It's nice and peaceful in here. I have absolutely no idea if it'll do me any good. But I'm certainly providing the weekend entertainment for the villagers. Okay. Ah, come, come, come. Okay, yeah, come. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wrap your hands well. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
السلام عليكم اوكي In this heat, I need this blanket like a hole in the head. But I am kind of relaxed. I'm heading for my furthest point north, the area around the third cataract. This is where the most dramatic discoveries about ancient Nubia are only just coming to light. This area is the most ancient part of Nubia, the mysterious land that the early Egyptians called Kush. It's also where the Sudanese government is planning to build a hydroelectric dam. Once again, Nubia is about to be flooded. Villagers will be forced to move, archaeological remains will be lost. History is repeating itself. Mashakela is one village that will definitely be drowned. It's the home of the oldest Quranic school in all of Nubia, and it's still run by two brothers whose family founded it 350 years ago. to this village yes. if the dam is built? No problem. No? Y yes. We all glad. We want to see the dam today mm -hmm. before tomorrow. But will this school a be school wiped out? Enough. You see, I want to tell you something. Mm -hmm. If somebody come make uh, a dam here, uh -huh, he can come, he come tell me, leave the mosque or leave your house. Mm -hmm. I see like my daddy died now. I understand. Eh? Mm. With that, I not can say no. Because this dam for him, Kajbar, mm -hmm. not for him, another people for uh, another country. For him, uh, the people for him, this country. When the dam is built, mm. this school, which is so old, which means so much yes. to you and your brother, mm. will be flooded away. <laughs> Sheikh Ashi stops our interview to talk to our translator. Language is a problem, but I know that he understands me. Just like Fazea back in Egypt, I think he's afraid to speak his mind. I'm a teacher too, so I know if I lost my school, if it was flooded, I would be sad. Uh huh. We can do. Mm. What can you do? Nothing. Nothing. Yes. Mm. The Sudanese need electricity and irrigation, but most people here believe that a much less damaging site could have been chosen for the dam. I could only find one person who was prepared to say so. The grand dame of Nubian politics is Suad Ibrahim. She believes that because the Nubian people are so fiercely independent, they are a threat to the fundamentalist government. These dams have removed the carriers of our culture, we are not a pure blood. We are carriers of an ancient culture that managed to remain vibrant even after we lost the ability to write. We are illiterate in Nubian 
letters. I am just beginning to, to remove my literacy. These people are the carriers of our culture. Inundation means a, a, a very rough uh, shortening, cutting. You would think they would be proud of the Nubian heritage. They pre ought to be. They yeah. ought to be. They ought to be. We are Sudanese. We are. No, we are. We do not plan. We are not separatists. Mm -hmm. We believe the Sudan from Halfa to Numuli is our home. But why would they want to inundate or bury Nubian culture? No, they they wouldn't put it that way. Of course not. Ah, they wouldn't put it that way. But that was originally the dams were loved. Mm -hmm. Now. The whole world is against them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, originally, dams were considered the, the way to progress, the way to provide industry, to irrigate more land, and so on and so forth. They give us beautiful words about development. But it's not development. What has happened is that we were scattered. Mm -hmm. Our kids are now living on the outskirts of cities all over whether in Egypt or in Sudan, because many don't like where the places that they are taken to. And in Sudan, uh, Kajbar Dam is different in that it is a political structure. It has nothing to do with development. It's so sad to think that even more of this rich ancient culture will be lost. 20 miles away, just beyond the reach of the new dam, archaeologists are making some of the most surprising discoveries in the whole of Africa. This is Kerma, Nubia's first capital, a 4,000-year-old city emerging from the sand. Every winter for the past 30 years, the Swiss archaeologist Charles Bonnet has been digging here. Here, naturally, we have the people doing the first cleaning of the surface and appearing, uh, we can see uh, the wall appearing step by step. It is a marvelous discovery because... Uh, oh, right there? Yes, oh, you see. can see a, yeah. a brick. Okay. Mm -hmm. This brick appeared during the last seconds. Huh. And this brick have more or less 3,800 years. This is 3,800 years yes, old? Yes, exactly. Wow. One of the strangest structures I've ever seen dominates this site. To me, it looks like a massive termite mound. This monument is a defufa. It is a Nubian term, uh, well, used generally to explain a construction done by men, and you can see it from far away in the horizon. Uh. In fact, it is the late period of a huge temple. Probably we have under a very small chapel and step by step, it's become this big monument done in mud brick. It was the main temple of the city and it is the center of the city. We have the palace, we have the defufa with all this religious quarter. Mm -hmm. We have in this side uh, a lot of chapels mm -hmm. and you have to think that we are cleaning the surface of mm -hmm. the city. That means if we go deeper and deeper we can find other cities older. with other, older naturally, yes. with other uh, institutions. Well, and this is fascinating naturally. It is. A thriving African city built before Stonehenge. And now the team is finding remains of an even more ancient city that dates back 5,000 years, older than even the pyramids of Giza. It's the very oldest city found so far in the entire continent of Africa. How much work remains to be done? Everything, <laughs> I must say, because it is the first town of a huge kingdom, 1,000 kilometers along the Nile. Hmm. It is 
it's the first level of a town, and there are many levels preserved. It is 240 graves, and there is still 20,000 graves to dig. I think that this region is, at the world uh, past, one of the most interesting uh, region of the world. But why, why are there so many sites in Egypt and not south of the border, not here in Sudan? Well, I think that Europeans choose to dig in Egypt. But you know, Egypt is extraordinary. When you think to the huge monument, you think to the temples. But today, archaeology is changing. We are thinking to men. And it is naturally marvelous to find a very beautiful statue, to find a treasury. But to find men, it's maybe an extraordinary answer, too. Mm. And it is why I'm passionate here. It is to find the men of the past and to understand better the men of today. Mm. Thank you. I began this journey in search of the black kingdoms of the Nile. To be perfectly honest, I was afraid that tales of lost cities and black pharaohs were only a figment of someone's imagination. I never dreamed that I'd actually find pyramids, painted tombs, and entire cities. But what makes me sad is that a lot of this could still disappear before anyone really has a chance to understand it. We sailed to a very fair place with lofty stone and mortar houses. The men are in color either tawny, black or white, and their women go attired with silk and gold in abundance. A Portuguese mariner wrote these lines when he reached the east coast of Africa in the 15th century. The Portuguese expected to find savages running naked through the bush. Instead, they discovered the Swahili, a sophisticated people, living in elegant stone towns, trading far across the Indian Ocean. Once, hundreds of Swahili settlements dotted this coast. Many are now in ruins, but some, with their distinctive Muslim culture, have survived to this day. I begin my journey on the island of Lamu, just off northern Kenya. I'll travel south along the Swahili coast, stopping off at the old ocean port of Mombasa. Finally, I'm sailing to the island of Zanzibar as I try to untangle the roots of the Swahili people. Lamu is the most traditional of all the Swahili towns. For 2,000 years, Arab merchants have settled on this coast. You can see their influence everywhere.
There seems to be a mosque on every street corner. And most children here are educated in Quranic schools. It feels more like the Middle East than Kenya. Yet I'm in the heart of black Africa. I'm going to see Sheikh Badawi, one of Lamu's most venerable Islamic scholars. John Bamze. Assalamu alaikum. Chikamu. I want to understand the history of Lamu. How Lamu was founded? Is it an Arab civilization or is it an African civilization? Lamu, in effect, was Arab civilization uh, since more than 1,000 hmm. years. Sheikh Badawi is proud of his Arabic roots. He tells me he can trace his family back to the Prophet Muhammad. You have a noble ancestry. Do, do you have African ancestors as well? Sasa, sisi ya tupendelei kwa kizazi cha kiafrika ni kitoevu. Lakini tuwayua Afrika na kizazi chake na pande mgini ya siya na kizazi chake. Lakini sasa... All his ancestors are coming from, from Arab people. And in the past, there was a system of making concubines. Con concubines. Yeah. yeah. Marrying those women. Yes. So it resulted to people to, to be considered as inferior. Ah, and the concubines were African women? Yeah, concubines, yeah. I see. Why did Arab men take African women as concubines? Maybe people could not afford to marry many Arabs, Arab people. So the Africans were, the local people were cheap. Oh. And other reasons best known to them. Whatever Sheikh Badawi says, that supposedly pure Arabic blood has long been mixed with the blood of black Africans. Historians say that Swahili culture was shaped by the monsoon trade winds. Arabs came here to trade with Africans. They had to wait six months for the winds to change before they could sail home. They took concubines, wives, and had children. One village still specializes in building dhows. The boats sailed for centuries by Swahili merchants. Today, everyone's on the beach helping launch a new DAO. Traditionally, it's the captain, not the boat, who's launched into the water first. Oh, 
Kofia jako. Oh. Holy Santa Juana. Yeah. Holy Santa. Yeah. Holy Santa. Uh, the Kuruma Tazza. <laughs> yeah. That was great. Good luck, just luck. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's only Kofia. Yeah. <laughs> Kofia. Kofia. Okay. You okay? Yeah. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> The Indian Ocean trade has long defined Swahili life. Africans and Arabs traded riches from the interior for the luxuries of the East. Ahmad Sagaf is an architect whose family has lived in Lamu for generations. Like Sheikh Badawi, he traces his ancestry back to Arabia. Yeah. Now, when your ancestors came here in the 13th century, did they mix with the Africans? Yeah, because they can't live by themselves. They have to mix with the people, so as to harmonize their stay in, in, the, in Kenya. So African men could marry Arab women? Mm, very rare, in a very rare case. Very rare. But uh, an Arab man can easily marry uh, an African woman. So the Arab men intermarried with African women, mm -hmm. and they created the Swahili people? Yeah, this is how the, the birth of the Swahili uh, language and culture came about. So you can trace your ancestry back to the 13th Yeah, century. I have um, a tree structure of our families. A family tree? Yeah, from uh, Prophet Muhammad up to my, my sons now. You do? Yes. Wow, that's great. I have a couple of that one. Huh. But can Africans trace their ancestry back that far? Not mostly, because most of them were illiterate. Yeah. So they, they don't know how to keep the records. This was the main uh, problem with those people. If you lived in the States, you would be called a black man. You're not black here. Here, yeah, I'm, I'm not black, because most of the people, they could, could recognize me as a, a local Arab. Uh, a local Arab? Yeah, a local Arab. Does that give you greater social standing here? Yes, very much, yes, because I can now identify myself as somebody else from other clans or from other families. Other clans, yeah. other families. Other families. Mm. That is the, the most important of uh, keeping up all these uh, records of the family tree structure. And you know what? It's exactly the same in my country. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants to be from elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> My conversation with Ahmed reminds me how black Americans used to claim descent from some distant Cherokee or Sioux ancestor. Anything but pure Negro. So far, all I've heard about here is their Arab ancestry, and not a lot about the Swahili's African side. I'm on my way to the ruins of Shanga the oldest city yet discovered on the east coast of Africa. Shanga holds important clues about the origins of the Swahili. Muhammad Badi and Abbas Shakuna took part in the original excavations. That is the Friday Mosque, and it's one of the most funniest features we found on this settlement. Let's uh -huh. go near it, I'll tell you. It's, it's huge. It is. One of the biggest, most. This is said to be 14th century. Now, this is facing the Kaaba in Mecca. So there is this mosque you see on the top, right. and then there is another mosque How old is below that? this one. How old is the one That below? one was said to be about 11th century. 11th century. And then we dug further down. Mm -hmm. That means this is the first strut of the town. Mm -hmm. Below it, there is a second town. Mm -hmm. And we went down under that second uh, town. We found the original settlement, huh. which was 
composed of mud and uh, wattle huts. The mud and wattle huts they found were laid out like other African villages further inland. This was a major discovery. It proves that Africans were already living here before the Arabs first landed. So then, in come the Arabs. The Arabs. 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. Okay. And they mix, intermarried with the local people. But did they conquer the local people? Or no. Did they, were they, they equals? They did it in this way. For example, you come in as an Arab, mm -hmm. you meet me, mm -hmm. a black man, you mix blood with me. Mm -hmm. So now there's more, no more war between me and you. I accept you as my brother. So you uh, eventually you become the boss of that area as Arabs. Mm -hmm. So the Arabs came to dominate, yeah, dominate the local people. Mm. So while the Arabs came to dominate the coast, Shanga shows that the Swahili's roots are African. And what's more, their language, Swahili, is a Bantu African language with some words borrowed from Arabic. Today it's the most widely used language in East Africa. I'm Zungu. Zungu, take it easy. Smoke, huh? Well, here, there, there. Yeah, here. Yeah. Abbas, my guide from Shanga, is typical of this Swahili mix. To me, he looks like an African, but he also has I'm distant there. Arab ancestry. Abbas, yeah. what do you think when the old Arab families here say that Lamu is Arab civilization, it's not African civilization? My, I can say my grandfathers come from Arabic. You Your know, grandfather's here. Yeah, but my 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 mother's is not Africa. It's come from here, by Junior. Yeah. But everything's changing, you don't know. First it was Arabic, and then uh, British come. And then now we are independent. You know? So it's, everything's changing. So we are still in Africa now. One of Abbas's wives is Arabic. Until recently, this would have been unthinkable. In the past, Arab men married African women, and almost never the other way around. You know, Abbas, I have two daughters, too. I've got nine. <laughs> but how many women? Mothers, just two mothers. Okay, two mothers. So you've been married twice, or? Yeah, I made it to, I've got two wives now. What's it like to have two wives? You know, where I come from, you only have one uh, wife. Yeah, our religion, we are allowed to marry four. Do you live in the same house? No, different house. You can't. You can't bring the same houses. But you know, Abbas, yeah. if my daughters, I would rather them have two husbands than them to be one w wife to a husband with two wives. To be a two husband. Yeah, I'd rather no. them to be. I don't want them to be. Come on, no, I it's would impossible. rather. I'd rather them to be How? in control. No, 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 no. That yeah. is fighting. You know. How can you put it? <laughs> two husband with one wife. <laughs> two great cultures, African and Arab, met and mixed on this coast. But in Lamu. It doesn't exactly feel like a marriage of equals. The Arabs weren't the only ones who came to exploit the coast. The British were here from the late 19th century up to 1960. They gave special privileges to those who claimed Arab descent, deepening racial divisions. In Lamu, these old prejudices live on, even though the island is now part of modern Kenya. A 
I'm on my way to the great Swahili city of Mombasa, 200 miles south through bandit country. I'm not sure whether I'm more afraid of the bus crashing or these guns going off. Mombasa was once one of the richest Swahili city-states. Today, it's Kenya's second city and a major Indian Ocean port. It's also one of Africa's most popular destinations for European tourists. Okay. Santi Santa Bona. Over the centuries, Mombasa was occupied by Arabs from Oman, by Portuguese adventurers, and by the colonial armies of Britain. The latest wave of intruders is armed only with traveler's checks and suntan cream. You know, though, I have to admit one thing. I never, never get used to coming to a resort in Africa and seeing nothing but mzungu, or plural, wazungu, it means white people. It just takes me out. I mean, seeing all these black servants, um, you know, basically kissing the behinds of a bunch of European tourists. I mean, you never see black tourists from the country, even the upper classes, at this kind of resort. And uh, I find it deeply disturbing. How much? I selling here around. How many shillings? You take the photo there. We charge you uh, six hundred. Six hundred for how long? Uh, depends. If you like one hour, one and a half hour, two oh. hours. Yes. Okay. Well, think about it. I'll let you know. Santi Santa Bona. You know, it's no accident that the people from Oman and the Saudi Arabians would move here. I mean, leaving all that desert and heat for this is spectacular. It's just so beautiful. The hotel offers so-called African entertainment for its guests. Not much insight into Swahili culture here. Another attraction is the Swahili Dow Cruise. It can't be worse than the dancing. Uh, 
actually the original people of the coast. And uh, basically here at Mombasa, we have uh, three groups of Swahili people. There is first of all the Swahili, who were actually who came about as a result of uh, you know uh, being born from an original Swahili family, whereby the father and the mother are original Swahili people. And then uh, we have the Swahili or a Swahili who was born in a family whereby when the Arabs came to the coast of Mombasa, they intermarried with the Swahili people here. Now, another group of the Swahili people are people who came from uh, other parts of Kenya and uh, they copied the culture, religion, and uh, became... I have expected to be irritated, but actually I like the guide's definition of the Swahili. It's much more generous and inclusive than anything I heard in Lamu. He told us that the Swahili are the original African inhabitants of the coast, as well as the result of intermarriage with the Arabs. He also said you can become Swahili just by moving here and becoming Muslim. Well, perhaps our guide's definition is a little too generous. To me, Mombasa feels much more a part of modern Kenya than Lamu does. It's Swahili, but it's somehow more African, less worried about protecting its Arabic purity. In the afternoon, I abandon the tourist trail. I've been invited to watch a spirit cult ceremony. I'm surprised to hear the medium chant verses from the Koran. The spirits themselves are divided into Arabs, Africans, and Swahilis, like a spiritual version of Swahili history. Traditional African religions here have absorbed the influence of Islam. Suddenly the man collapses as the spirit leaves him. The spirit is led to the shrine. So what, what did I just see? What happened? I'm totally Mm. 
Alafu sasa nataka aoge dawa akishamaliza alafu aikwe pale. Sasa wakati ule sasa ngoma furaha tu kwa sasa. Itabibwa ngoma kwa furaha kwa kule ashaondoka mbali. Ashaondoka. Sasa watakuja wale wa furaha. Eh wale wa furaha. Na bahani tu de. Well, now I know the origin of the funky chicken. <laughs> The exorcism seems to have worked, but it looks like a case of malaria to me. North of Mombasa, lies the most spectacular of all the ruined Swahili cities, Gedi. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Malik Yawm Al-Din My tour begins in the remains of the grand 15th century mosque. So with the help of the echo, as you realized, mm -hmm. the message would be conveyed and received very simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And for that, those women at that time had no complaints at all, <laughs> right? They could hear him very vividly. They couldn't see him as well. They couldn't see him, but they could hear him. The front part of it was entirely meant for men, and the hand part was specifically kept for the ladies. The curator, Abdallah Alausi, yes, shows me around town. This big house, which is known as House of the Dao. Mm -hmm. and the House of the Dao. The House of the Dao. Mm -hmm. It shows that the owner of this house was a very rich man, and he decided to... Abdallah says that in the late 14th century, the Swahili built a remarkable stone city. More than 2,000 people once lived here, and it flourished for 300 years. In the, for the town? When the British archaeologists uncovered these ruins in the 1950s, they saw Getty as an Arab settlement. So this is the Sultan's palace. Yeah, here we have a big palace. When's it date from? Well, it should be in the 15th century. 15th. Because this town was at its peak in the 15th century, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We are now in the main court or audience court, and it was here where they used to discuss all their town affairs. This bench on our left was meant for the Sultan, and this one here was meant for his ministers, and of course the sunken court was meant for the public. Abdallah says that this courtyard would once have been crowded with citizens petitioning their ruler. The Sultan's palace was the center of a sophisticated urban society. And people here put a high priority on the comforts of life, including the most important of all to me, good plumbing. Normally when Swahili visit the toilet, they don't stand, but they squat. And oh. this is what we normally do. After finishing all the official business here, as far as number one is concerned, mm -hmm. somebody would get hold of the mug and he would leave that in the water and then he would wash up himself and then he'd call it a day. He'd walk out uh, of the toilet. Okay. And there we have a hall again. That was for number two, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. So squatting again would be done here mm -hmm. and all official business would be done here. And it, it's not, I mean, a long distance from there to here. <laughs> so somebody would just get hold of the mug, leave that in the water and then he would wash up himself and then he would call it a day. I've seen toilets in Europe that are not this good. <laughs> <laughs> Who built this civilization? The indigenous of this place were Swahilis, and later on they were joined by the Persians. So you mean in 1399? Yep. The people who built this were African people? Typical Africans. Typical Africans. Did they look like you? Of course, why not? Are you a Swahili? I'm typical Swahili. So these were black people? These were black people very like you and I. Unlike the British archaeologists, Abdallah says Getty was an African city built by Africans. This grand city was built by the Swahili. And here on the mainland of Kenya, the Swahili are seen as Africans.
From Mombasa, I fly south to Dar es Salaam, the capital of Tanzania. From there, I take the ferry to Zanzibar. The fabled island of Zanzibar is the last and perhaps the greatest of the Swahili city-states. In the 18th and 19th centuries, Zanzibar was a major trading nation. It grew rich by exporting spices and slaves. I first came here in 1970, six years after a violent revolution. 5,000 people had been killed when Africans rose up against the Arabs and the Indians. I was 20 years old. We got into Zanzibar, and um, Sheikh Karume was the president at the time. He ran something called the Revolutionary Group, and he had just passed a law giving him and the 13 or 14 other members of the ruling council the right to not only sleep with, but marry any 14 year or older virgin, particularly Indian virgins. It was the most bizarre thing I've ever encountered. It's like, um, it's like once the Africans took over, they reinstituted slavery in reverse, able to enslave the, uh, the daughters of the Arab merchants or the daughters of the Indian merchants. An air of repression hung all over the island. As strong as the scent of cloves, all of the sidewalks were covered with cloves that had just been harvested. And they would let them dry out in the sun. I'm not sure that those cloves are still there, but I hope they are. My first stop is a fishing village south of the capital. I've heard that most people in Kizimkazi claim to be Persian. You both were born in Kizimkazi? Yeah. Yes. So where did your ancestors come from? Hey, our ancestors came from Persia. From Persia? Yes. When? Uh, really, I, I, I cannot tell you when, but uh, I mean, they came here for many centuries ago. Mm. My historical teacher in the school there, he taught me about uh, 500 years they came here. So your family came from Persia and has been here for 500 years? Yes. yes. Are there Africans in the village or just Persians? Uh, the most of the villagers here are Persians. Mm. I think there are some African, but I don't know if uh, they are still here until now. Within the village, is it better to be Persian than African? Persians. Persian. So you have more status. Why? Well, because our ancestors come from Persia. Hmm. So why is that better than coming from the interior? Yeah, we, we feel so. Because, uh, you see, it is a place which uh, our parents came from, mm -hmm. according to the historical. Mm -hmm. So just we have to uh, explain us about uh, the delight where our parents came from. Would you be surprised to know that if you came with me back home to Boston, yeah. okay. Americans would say, you just look African to them. There's no difference between Persians and Africans. Do you know that? Yes, of course, yeah, I do. To me, the people here look about as Persian as Mike Tyson. Just yards from the beach, however, are the remains of a 12th century mosque, the oldest in Zanzibar. It is a Kufi greetings. 
Shirazi ratings. Well, the brown thing? Yeah. Yes. Ah, yeah. That is a, the written the time which this mosque finished to build. One, one, zero. Nobody in the village can read these ancient Kufic inscriptions. But sure enough, they really do show that this mosque was built by people from the Persian Gulf over 800 years ago. Before heading back to town, my new Persian brothers invite me out on their boat. Abu runs a business taking tourists to see the dolphins. I can't resist. Oh, I see them! I see them! So it's true that the Persians really did settle in Zanzibar, just as the Arabs and later the Indians did. But why do so many people here claim to be the descendants of a handful of medieval Persian mariners? It's a bit like me claiming to be white because my great-great-grandfather was an Irishman named Brady. I think the answer lies in the shadows of Zanzibar's history as the center of the East African slave trade. On this island, to call oneself African is to admit to being the descendant of a slave. The Anglican Cathedral of Zanzibar sits on the site of the old slave market, built here, they say, to atone for the sins of the past. Canon Gada takes me to the high altar, where the old whipping post once stood. That whipping post was uh, a place where these slaves, coming one by one, uh, would change. They were taken there, and if they, she, he was a woman, she was a woman, they, she would be put half naked. Mm. And she would be told to turn around to show the morphology and all that. You see, so that the buyers would see the morphology and place the price. Now, before buying, those people wanted to know how strong that man was and how strong that woman was. They would whip, bully, and do all sorts of things. Those who cried and fell down, they couldn't be, get price. So the one who brought that slave would just drag and kill. <laughs> This place gives me the creeps. Like most African Americans, I'm the descendant of slaves. And since I broke my hip when I was 14, I probably wouldn't have survived. My ancestors were slaves. Yes. So How do you feel about it? It's very sad for me to be here. Now, 
I think you have forgiven them. I don't know how good a Christian I am, Father. Well, you have to. You have to forgive them. How could the Jews forgive the Germans of the Holocaust? How could you forgive? It is only when you know the love of God. It is very difficult in human speaking. Mm -hmm. Because really, somebody who really killed your, your sisters, you can't forgive. But I'm a handicapped. I, could, I would have been killed. I would have been killed. Yes, yes, but uh, lucky enough, you are still alive. Yeah, thank God. And you are now one of the, those who were born away from, their, from home. A long way. A long way. Yeah. Oh, As far as I'm concerned, you'd need an ocean of baptismal water to wash away all the sins committed on this site. Tens of thousands of slaves were bought and sold here every year. Many were sent to the Middle East. Others worked the clove plantations here on the island. And a few even went to the New World. Zanzibar became so rich that in 1840, the Sultan of Oman moved his capital here, along with his court and his 99 concubines. The most famous and wealthy of all the Sultan's subjects was the notorious Swahili slave trader, Tipu Tip. Look at that door. That's nicer than any of the doors I've seen in Stonetown. Maybe you've not seen many. No, I've seen a lot. <laughs> his great-great-granddaughter, Umi Hamid, a journalist, takes me to his house. It's rumored that Tipu Tip buried 40 slaves in the foundations of this mansion to strengthen its walls. Yeah. Then he was in good shape. How do you, how do you feel about your great-great-grandfather? I feel that it was the trend of the time. Mm -hmm. That was business, purely. You either be a slave or a slave. You choose the lesser of the two evils. <laughs> and if you're in a position to be a slave, why should you be a slave? The slavery was different from the slavery of Americans. Mm -hmm. The Arabs took their slaves and married them, mm -hmm. and they intermingled with them. It was quite different with the slaves in the West, in the America, mm -hmm. where they were mostly used for plantation, and they never, there was racism. Yes. With Arabs, they they married their slaves, so this is the difference. Arab men married, married African women, women yes. but not the other uh, way Not around. vice versa, but at least they married them, yes. and uh, they had children with them. We are the product. No, that's true. Umi, your great-great-grandfather was a slave trader. My great-great-great-great-grandfather was a slave. It's possible that someone in your family, many, many hundreds of years ago, purchased and sold someone in my family. Quite possible. I think we should treat that as a sorry part of the history and that chapter is closed. Mm -hmm. And we shake hands. <laughs> Thank you. I never thought I'd ever meet a black slave trader descended. I mean, it never occurred to me. You know, in America, when you think of slavery, you think of white people. You don't even think of Arabs that much, though the Arabs were fundamental to the slave trade, of course, but it's, everything in America is so black and white. And then when actually you meet someone and then you think, wow, you know, black people, you would be black. In America, they wouldn't be interested in all this Persian Arab stuff. You would but be a no black person. Zanzibar's bloody history did not end with slavery. 
In the 1964 revolution, the descendants of African slaves rose up and slaughtered Arabs and Indians in a night of terrible violence. The revolution was just weeks after Zanzibar gained independence from Britain. Umi was a small girl at the time, caught in the midst of a violent witch hunt. It was frightening because we are of a mixed race. Some of them, half of my family are very, very fair. Mm. Half of them are black. But we are known that we are descendants of Arabs and we had the affiliations to them at that time. So it was really scary to think of what might happen, knowing that uh, it was a war between Arabs two, and Africans. Yes, things like that. Yeah. The change came so abruptly, unexpectedly, mm. when the people capitalized on that. Not, it, it, it wasn't only politics by then. It could have been grudges and other reasons. After the revolution, Zanzibar's new regime turned out to be as brutal and as repressive as the old one. It's only in the past few years that the island is once again opening up to the outside world. That was a phase which we had to go through. And thinking of it, this island can't be Arab. Where is Arabia? Where is Middle East? And where is Zanzibar? <laughs> It's two different things. Zanzibar is here beside the African continent. We are influenced by the Arabs, mm -hmm. but we can't say that this is an Arabic place. Even the name means land of the blacks. Yes. Today, most Zanzibaris are the descendants of slaves, but it's a fact that few want to be reminded of. No wonder so many of the Swahili claim to be Persian or Arab, anything but African. It's been so easy to say that everything of value in Swahili culture belongs to the Arabs or the Persians or anyone else passing by. When I was growing up, we used to say, if you're light, you're all right. If you're brown, get down. If you're black, get back. It's taken my people 50 years to move from Negro to black to African American. I wonder how long it will take the Swahili to call themselves African. Discover the wonders of the African world at PBS Online. Set your browser from pbs.org. Wonders of the African World with Henry Louis Gates, Jr. was made possible with contributions to your PBS.